So screen link is on. And hmm. This part is not updated correctly, so that's kind of suspicious right there. I'm going to start the streaming again. Okay. Very good. And the class is a little bit smaller today. <laughs> okay. But I'm going to start anyway. Um, so the, the reason why I have this picture up was actually a leftover from my CISP 363 class. Um, and I was trying to illustrate you know, how much technology has come along since the end of World War II. Okay? So at the end of World War II, we saw the first jet fighters. Um, this is the first one. You know, the Germans you know, started to use jet fighters at the very end of World War II. Um, and the speed of this thing is about a quarter of the speed of an SR-71, the Blackbird. Okay, so you would go like, wow, you know, the new the Blackbird you know, being the fastest airplane ever is pretty fast. Okay, four times the speed of the jet fighter at the end of World War II. So you would think, well, technology has come a long, a long way. But I would argue that is not the case. I would argue this is a very slow paced development. The advance is very slow, and we really haven't got, gotten that far ahead compared to the end of World War II. Because at the end of World War II, we also saw the first digital computer. Okay, what was the name of that computer that was used to decrypt uh, the um, Enigma encoding? Okay, well, we, we can just look it up. Enigma, Enigma decode British computer. That should find it, right? That's an electrical mechanical device. Uh, co-worker. I'm looking for the name of the machine. Isn't it just the Enigma machine, or is that something else? I think the Enigma is the encryption machine. Uh, encryption, not the Right. So the computer to break the encryption is has a different name. The um, cipher, maybe. It's just, no, that's mechanical, the electromechanical. Well, it has a lot of disks. Maybe that's it. Okay. So this is the first you know, digital computer that we have at the end of World War II. So if you think about it, your cell phone, your watch, okay, probably has tons more processing power than this. Okay, and that's no surprise because Moore's law. Okay, if you think about it, you know, using the Moore's law term, okay, the advance of jet technology, jet, you know, uh, airplane technology, which is now four times as fast as you know, at the end of World War II. How long would it take using Moore's law to quadruple performance? Moore's law says what? Every eighteen months, we have doubled it. So in thirty-six months one year and a half. No, 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 three years, in three years, excuse me. So in three years, we would have achieved you know, the same achievement that jet engines have achieved from 47 to 2017, which is 70 years. Okay, so if you look at things from that perspective, you know, semiconductor or computer technology is much faster paced compared to aviation technology. So even if there's no jet engine and we're still flying biplanes and whatnot, we will still have drones, but except it would be biplanes. <laughs> but the opposite is not true. Okay, the opposite. Let's just say the jet engine technology has improved to be even 16 times what it was in World War II. But computer technology has never moved or moved at a very slow pace. Okay. So now the question is, can we still have drone or autonomous you know, flying vehicles? The answer is no, because even if you put, even if you use B-52s, which are gigantic airplanes, it will take multiple B-52s to fit all the hardware of a single computer. So now you have a fleet of B-52s flying with wired tethering so that you know, all of these components can work together. 
I can only imagine how much trouble they have to do to take off and also land because now we have all these little wires and whatnot to, to interconnect the components because it's one single computer, but it's so big that you need multiple B-52s to carry it. As opposed to our drones, right? You know, how big is, this, is the smallest drone? Palm size, right? <laughs> And I would suspect the military may have even smaller drones, okay? Because if they use, the Marines would use it to kind of scout ahead to see what's ahead, you know, try to run the corner and stuff like that. So those would be even smaller. So if you think about that, you know, in terms of your know, computation technology, um, they truly have come a long, long, long way. But what is interesting also is what we talk about in this class is still true. Okay, we are still using transistors, we're still using gates and stuff like that to build these computers. So that part has not changed all that much. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of these. It's just, you know, some left over from my other class, CISB363. Let me just double check, make sure it is streaming. It is streaming, very good. And what we'll do today is to take a look at subroutines because last time we kind of stopped with subroutines right before the uh, midterm. So today we'll kind of resume with the discussion of calling subroutines and returning from subroutines and also do recursion using our toy processor. Okay. So before we go any further, okay, um, the answer to the test is already online. I screened on that day you know, to talk about the answer. So I'm not going to spend any time to talk about it today. So what we'll do is we'll start right off with a simple recursive um, subroutine that doesn't do anything really useful. So I'm going to call this one recurs, recursion one.c. Okay, we'll see how far, how many of these you know, sample programs we can, we can write today. So we have a single subroutine called f. Okay, this is the other one because we have main as well. And f doesn't do a whole lot, okay? There's a single global variable. I know we're not supposed to use global variables, but to make this really simple, we're going to use global variables. So we have a global variable called x. And what f is going to do is to say, if x is greater than 0, then it's going to do the recursion. But before that, it will decrement x by 1 first, and it's going to call itself. Um, and that's the entire sovereignty. Doesn't do anything particularly useful, but it's guaranteed to stop. Because you know, when, as, as long as x is greater than 0, when it, it, right before it calls the recursive you know, version of itself, it will decrement x. So x will go from 4 to 3 to 2 to 1, and eventually it will be 0. 0 is greater than 0 is false, which means it's not going to call itself, and it will start to unwind the stack. And we'll just call this from main. So main doesn't really do anything useful either. The only thing main does is to call f and initialize x first. Okay, so depending on how you know many stacks or how many levels you want, you know, we can four is good. And then we turn zero like, just like that. So this is going to be our sample program to illustrate in C and C++. How do we do recursion and what is actually going on on the stack as we do recursion? Is that okay so far? Are there any questions about this program itself? Particularly, you know, uh, function f. Okay, no questions? All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, compile this program and we'll run it in GDB because that's the only time we can actually see it, you know, the recursion and how it unwinds itself. So we have gcc dash one all <coughs> dash o recursion one that will give me the executable and then we have dash oh, oh, just recursion one dot c which is the source code gdb recursion one and we'll put a breakpoint in uh, function f right at the entry point so this way every single time we call f it's going to stop at the entry point of f there we go and it will just go ahead and run the program all right so this is the first breakpoint and if you list the program, oh, I forgot to compile the, the dash g, so we can't really see the source code. So we will attach a dash g to the command line, we run the program, put a breakpoint on line f again, I mean a function f, run the program. So now we are on line four, okay? And this is at the very beginning of function f. And if we continue execution, it will go to line um, four again. But it will be helpful to print what is the value of x. 
x was 4, it was initialized to 4, but because right before the first time we do the recursion, it was decremented, so it went from 4 to 3. Okay. But how do we know we, this is the second level, this is the second time we got into f? There's a, there's a command in GDB called B backtrace, or abbreviated as BT. So when you use BT, it will show you, you know, what we call frames okay, on the stack. And you can see the number zero, or pound zero, is referring to the last, you know, the, the very last or the most recent invocation of F. Um, pound one is referring to the earlier one. And then pound two refers to, okay, but who's calling all of these things? Well, if everything starts from A, so it's no surprise that A is uh, the last one. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. <clears throat> And obviously, if I continue execution, it will you know, just give us you know, more and more instances of f. And if you print x, it is now 2. So now it will be 1. And now it will be 0. So let's double check you know, how many levels do we have of f. we got five levels. It makes sense. Because you know, x, the, the value of x goes from 4 to 3 to 2 to 1, and then finally to 0. But this time it's not going to call itself again because x zero, x being zero, is no longer greater than zero. So it's going to skip around the then portion and it will just go ahead and unwind the entire thing. Is that okay so far? Okay. So when we single step at this point, it's going to single step to the end of the conditional statement, and then when we single step one more time, it's going to go to oh, it just yields. You know, it, it just unwind you know, everything all the way out. I couldn't unwind it one step at a time because I need, there, there was nothing to do after it unwinds. I, sh I should have put something right after the recursive call so there's a place to stop and examine. But basically it just unwind, you know, unwound everything all the way to the beginning. So are we doing okay so far with this particular subroutine? Okay. So what we want to do is to replicate this but using the toy processor. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the toy processor. I've made some changes. So if you have not downloaded the, uh, um, the toy processor recently, you might want to kind of download it again. Um, particularly, the architecture has changed as per the exam. Okay, so now we have the increment and the decrement instructions. And then all that wrong is also changed so that we actually have the increment and decrement instructions too. So let me show you where you can get that. So we'll go to a particular folder so that we can go back to 310, go to shared, go to processor. And you can also see from the date of the files, okay, it's not showing here, but you can uh, show the date of the file. Um, once you know the date of the files, you would see that this is the new version of the processor with the changes that you saw in the test incorporated into this particular one. So it has the capability of incrementing and decrementing. So we'll go ahead and download this file. Okay. It's already downloaded in, on my drive, so I don't have to do it. But when you want to experiment with these instructions, you have to first download the newer version of the processor architecture. And you also want to download uh, all.rom because that one is also updated. You can see it was updated today at uh, about noon time. Okay. So both of these are updated. And I think I might need to, I might have the latest version already on my drive. We'll, we'll double check. So we'll go to the processor folder and do an ls-l so it will show the timestamp. All up wrong, oops, it's not even here. And I don't have the latest processor either, so I will have to download both of those onto my own drive. So let's do that. And download to my processor subfolder. And then the other one is the new processor architecture. It's processor WDPC and then with a two. So I would have to download this one too. To exactly the same folder. And we 
go. So now I can go ahead and get it started. Um, of the exam question into this control line. This was the question mark you know, tunnel. And I call it FC for, um, why did I call it FC? Flag, oh, I call it flag clutch. <laughs> That's why, because it is it's one ability to kind of disengage the flags register so that you can continue to operate the ALU, but it won't affect the flags. So that's why I call it you know, a flag clutch, <clears throat> as in the clutch of a stick shift car. Um, and then the input of these two are one is coming from R01 DMX. So this is you know, non negated. ALU EN is also non negated. But the output of this AND gate is negated. So this way, um, under normal circumstances, when you're using the ALU using all the existing instructions like add, subtract, and compare, and so on and so forth, um, both of these tunnels will be a one, which forces the FC itself to be a zero. If FC is a zero, so this is the line of FC, so if FC is a zero, it will first choose input zero of this box to feed to into, but input zero of this box is just you know, whatever we are expecting out of you know, out one of the register bank. In other words, this way is not affecting existing instructions. Existing instructions will work just fine as the way they are. At the same time, this uh, not gate here will negate the zero into a one so that the flex register will be updated just like usual. Okay, so it won't affect existing instructions in any way. But when we need the increment or the decrement instruction, then we want the box to choose the other one. So in that case, what I can do is I can still enable ALU because I still need the ALU to operate. But then I can choose um, R01 DMUX to be a zero. So as a result, the output is going to be a one. When the output is one or FC is a one, then we are, forced, we are forcing this MUX to choose uh, the constant of one as the input. And therefore, we are forcing the, the constant of one as in two into the ALU. At the same time, because there's a NOT gate here, so the enable pin or the enable port of flags is also forced to be a zero, which means it is not going to update the flags register. So this is the solution to um, one of the questions in the exam. But I'm incorporating this into the processor architecture because this is a very useful instruction, being able to increment and decrement a register, but without affecting the flags register is actually quite useful. Okay, so but just doing the architectural change is not sufficient because we also have to update the ROM in order to include those instructions. So we go here and then we say load image and all that ROM is just, you know, I just downloaded that from the um, server. So we can just go ahead and update it. Okay, so before we do the recursive function, it is useful to make sure the increment and decrement are working the way they're supposed to. So now we switch to the browser, we go to the assembler, and we'll go ahead and write a simple program to check it. And if one is already there. Um, so if you go to the assembler spreadsheet, the one that I have, okay, you, can make a, you should make a new copy if you have made copies already in the past, because I have changed the way it assembles. So in the source code here, I have just written, you know, I wrote a um, very simple program to test whether increment is working or not. Okay. So in this case, I'm just you know, forcing register A to have a value of 20 to begin with, increment, increment. So I can, I can watch whether register A is getting incremented or not. And then I've also decremented it twice to make sure that you know, I can also observe the decrement operation. And then we just have a halt to basically you know, finish the entire operation. So to test this program, <coughs> what we do is we go to the RAM file tab, 
and then we just go ahead and specify we want to download the CSV file and we will just go ahead and download it to the temp folder that's fine we'll call this the test ink deck testing the increment and decrement instructions and then switch back to Logisim uh, click the reset button just to make sure that everything is reset to the default state and then go to RAM and then load that program into here and that program is called test <coughs> okay, I cannot remember the name I know it starts with a T test there we go so it's test increment decrement and then click open so that we have that program here you can single step through the whole thing. You can you just you'll watch the clock tick if you want to. But if you want a quick and easy way to test and go like, okay, I just you need to make sure that the instruction is working. One thing you can do is to go to simulate and then you go to login. And if you're pretty confident that your instruction is working correctly, you can go to register bank and then just just you know pull the register that you want to watch, which is register A, the first one, and you know just make sure that that's, that's working. So now I can just go ahead and go to simulate, enable the take, and you can see that this is taking a lot slower than I expected. Um, so now it's stuck with the halt instruction. We can now turn off um, tick enabled, and then we can go back to the logging part, and then go to the table, and we can see how register A is being changed over time. Originally it was a zero because of the reset, and then it got zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero. Remember, the first bunch of four bits, they specify how many 16s we have. So we have 116, and then the 0100 tells us that we have four added to the 16, which is 20. So we did initialize it to 20, and then we got to 21, got to 22, and then back to 21, and then back to 20. So we know the increment and decrement instructions are working correctly. Okay. If you want to test whether it is affecting the um, the flags register or not, you can design a slightly different program to do that. So let's go ahead and test that too. So let's go to <clears throat> the source tab so we can change the program just a little bit. So to test whether it is going to change the flags register or not, I would start with zero. Because if you start with zero and you increment it, if you accidentally somehow messed up you know, the clutch you know, for the flags register, it's going to change because it will assert that the zero flag will now be a one, okay? And all of the other ones would be zeros. But when I decrement, okay, you know, increment only once, decrement again, so that would uh, assert the zero flag because it's going back to zero. But if you decrement it one more time, then the carry flag would also be set because then it will be FF. And then the sign flag would be set as well. Is that making any sense? So this program is much better in terms of testing whether the flex register will be modified or not. Okay. So we can always test this. And if you think that the assembler may not be assembling this correctly, pick something other than A. The problem with register A is it is represented by 0, 0. So if I mess up the assembler somewhere, okay, and not, do not take the register into consideration, Register A is very likely to, to work, but the other registers you know, are not likely to work because they're not zero, zero. So for testing that purposes, for testing purposes, let's pick D, which is one, one. Or if you, want, if you don't want something that is symmetric, because one, one is symmetric, if you spell it backwards, it's the same thing, pick D or C, okay? Because C is one, zero. So if I somehow mess up the assembler and spell it backwards, or you know, spell out the bit pattern backwards, this is not gonna work. All right, so the first thing we do is we go to the assembler tab, assemble tab, just to make sure that the instruction is correct, the opcode is correct. And we can see right here that it is assembling correctly. Okay. Go back to you. I want to show both the instruction and also the opcode. So for, for row two, the instruction is increment C, but remember we are using two bit fields in order to specify um, which register we are incrementing. So the base code is D0, but then we are also uh, using 1010 because C itself is 10, but we have to specify twice because it's taking both 
the x, x, and the y, y place. So we have 1, 0, 1, 0, which is an A. So DA is, in fact, the correct R code for the instruction increment C. And then for decrement, it is also supposed to have an A as the least significant um, 16, base 16 digit. So this is, this is all correct. So the assembler does the job correctly. Then we go to the RAM file, and we go ahead and save this one, or download it as a CSV. And we can call it the same name as last time. And switch back to the LogiSim simulator. Reset the whole thing first. And then reload the new program. There we go. And let me see, there's one more thing. Yeah, okay, we, we have to change the way we are logging. Um, because in addition to logging register, well, we don't want to log register A anymore because register A is not getting changed. So we're removing register A, we're putting register C instead, you know, as something that we are watching. But we also want to watch the flags register, which is up here somewhere, right there. Okay, so we're watching the flags register because that is not supposed to be changing at all in this program. If it changes, then we have a problem. So now we can go ahead and close window and simulate this thing. And I think it's slow because I changed the uh, tick frequency. It's now at 8 hertz. That's why we can actually visually see the program actually running. Okay. So now it has reached the, uh, the halt instruction. It's time to stop the simulation. Go to logging. Go to the table. And Google, we saw the flags register getting changed. And register the register itself is not getting changed. So that means we have a problem. <laughs> it's not working. OK. So if it's not working, my first suspicion is the opcode is not getting in. OK. All.rom is not correct. OK. So we'll, we'll check that first. Step by step. So we go to the processor folder, go to opcodes, and this should have all the new instructions too. Do we see increment? Yep, we see increment, we see decrement here as well. Then the order of creating the final all.rom is now important. The, the problem is, if I specify decrement and increment in the wrong order, the opcode emitted by dec and inc can be overwritten by the original instructions. Remember, we're stealing stuff, right? So whoever we're stealing from needs to generate the code first and so that the deck and ink can hijack those opcodes. So we'll double check that. We'll have to check that first. Um, I think we can run the deck by itself. Oh, but then it's expecting me to feed it something. Uh, mm, let's see, there's one. Empty, there we go. So we can feed it empty, and it gives us you know, something starting at 3584. Okay. And it's borrowing from compare. So we do the same thing with compare. And we can see that you know, they are, do, do, do you see how they are using the same location? Because these are just you know, zeros to pad the beginning. So that means that the first code, which is this one here, is starting at location decimal uh, 3584. And they're both starting at eight, uh, 3584, which is correct. Okay, that part, we don't have a problem with that part. The problem that we might have is where's the next one? So the next one is uh, off by 62 locations. But that's correct because we are using two locations for this particular opcode. So we're skipping a whole bunch to get to the next one. You know, we're skipping basically um, four opcodes of space in order to get to the next one. So this is actually correct as well. So the next question is, in the make file, wh where is increment and decrement? Because whatever order you specify here in opcodes as a, as a macro, if ink is the last, second last one and then dec is the second last, is the very last one, this is the order that the file will be generated. Okay, so that's why this is correct. Okay, so we don't have a problem with this either. 
So now the question is, why is it, why is it still not working correctly? We'll go ahead and do a make here, just to make sure that all our ROM is up to date, and then we'll compare whether this one is the same as the other one. So we'll do a diff all.rom with the other all.rom, which is the one that is already loaded into the ROM, and they are the same. Okay. Hmm. So now we have a little bit of a suspicion here. So now we need to actually manually go in and make sure that this is the code at the right place. Okay. So I'm just going to write this down. This is 15185B8. And it is corresponding to, this is decrement. And the opcode of decrement is I'm using exactly the same as this documentation here. So it is an E, this is this should be an E0101, so it's an E5. Okay. So now we go to the logic sim, we go to the ROM, and ooh, oh that, that's fine. That doesn't look right to me. Because this is supposed to be the um, the whole instruction and it's missing. In fact, I don't know if it's starting to have something, but the whole instruction is not there. Do we know what flag, what flag fires? What exact flag is it? Like L flag or wall flag? The flags register contains all of those flags. But do we know from that code which flag uh, we actually see? Um, you or won't see the itself. individual flag. You will only see the composite of the of the bits. But the problem is, you know, my my halt opcode is not even here. Okay, am I forgetting to specify the halt here? Um, Halt instruction is missing entirely from here. Something is not. Oh, okay. The halt instruction is at four zero nine six. Okay, so never mind that. We want to go to location E50. E50. And it seems to be the correct code. Um, 15, ooh, it is not correct. It is supposed to be 15185B8. This is what I wrote down. And this is definitely not the right code. Okay. So let's stop simulation and load the image again from all.com. Sorry? Maybe it's an old version of the ROM. Possibly. But I thought we loaded it today. Okay, one five one eight five B eight. This is still incorrect. Oh wait, this is the one. It's an E four instead of an E five. So the assembler cranked out the wrong. The assembler cranked out the right code, but the uh, the code generation part is generating the wrong code. So that means you know, deck dot C is not doing you know, its job correctly. I think I know exactly why. Okay, that's good. The one why is you know, using the incorrect code is good. So this part is still okay, but I have to you know, invent a new code uh, of why y is xx <laughs> because they're supposed to be the same. So I'm not going to specify. You know, it, it won't generate. It won't generate the 16 variants because there are only four variants. Okay, do you guys understand why there are only four variants as, as opposed to 16? 
do, sort of. Okay. Some of you do. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we are hijacking. Okay. So we are. So the original instruction, the opcode where we are hijacking from, is the compare instruction. Okay. So the compare instruction has you know the xx and the yy, right? And xx is one of the four registers. Y is one of the four registers. So what the um, What is okay? So there are sixteen variants of these because you can have you know comparing A to A, A to B, A to C, A to D, and then you can compare B to A, B to B, and so on. So there are sixteen variants of these. We are not hijacking all sixteen. We are only hijacking when we are comparing the same registers. So there are only four of these: B B, and then we have C C, and then we have D D over here. So these are the ones that are being hijacked. And as a result, you know, they have their own code. So this one, you know, has will become we're hijacking this one, so that it becomes um, decrement A. We are hijacking this one, so it becomes decrement B. We are hijacking this one, so it becomes decrement C, and so on. Compare itself has a base code of E zero to begin with. Okay, and then X X Y Y specifies the lower portion, which is this zero here. When you are working with B, okay, register B is represented by the bit pattern zero one, okay. So that means zero one zero one and then E is one 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 zero. This is supposed to be the opcode for decrement B. But what we saw earlier in the wrong file here is is at the wrong place. This is the code that I wrote down, which is supposed to be the decrement code. It is at the wrong place. So what we saw here, E40 has an opcode, is corresponding to the opcode of 1110-0100. So somehow my program is not generating the 01 here correctly. Okay, so that's why it is not working. So time to go to the, the source code here. And the problem is most likely in uco.c because that's where all that you know really ugly loop is located to do all the uh, possible variants. So in this case, um, I added the constant called yy is xx. So it is tested here. If yy offset is yy is xx. That basically tells me that, oh, okay, that is why. Because it is still a real offset, I still need to know the offset to that thing. Ah, okay, that is why. Hmm. I was trying to be lazy so that I can just you know, somehow you know, hack the existing code to take care of this <laughs> new problem. And as it turns out, I can't quite do that. Because I, I, I'm trying to use the same parameter to control two things. The, the first one is to say that, you know, OK, do not iterate through all the possible y's. They'll just make y stick with x. And then the second one is, oh, but where is yy? You'll know, tell me the big location of yy. So I'm trying to combine two things into one, and obviously that is not working. <laughs> OK. So we have xx offset, we have yy offset, and both are required. This is the offset of the microcode slice itself from the beginning of that opcode. So we cannot hijack that one either. We cannot change that one. One way to do this, you know, it's just that I, I don't like to do it that way, but it's probably the, the cleanest solution, especially when the amount of time is short and I don't want to make changes that can break something else. So let's go back to the other one. So we, we are now back to decrement.c. So instead of doing the loop inside right slice, we can do the loop outside of the right slice. So we can do the looping here. So here we just say no xx and no yy. 
I'm hoping after the break you guys can remember the, uh, the source code. No? <laughs> kind of, okay, kind of is good. Okay, so what we'll do is we're gonna put a loop here instead. Okay, so we'll say and, um, oh, this is regular C, it's not C++, so you cannot declare variables any way you want to. So we can declare at the very beginning, this is gonna be zero. And then we just put a loop here. Um, okay, just to be consistent. X is less than four, plus plus X, X. No. There we go. And then we just have to incorporate the, the XX into here. So now this one is do it or um, XX shifted twice or XX itself. Okay. Are there any questions about this part? You know, why I am changing the opcode itself to become E0, which is you know, the base code of that particular opcode, but I have to OR that, bitwise OR, with XX shifted twice and then XX itself. XX shifted twice would account for this part, and then XX is accounted for this part. So now I'm you know, basically just calling the right size individually for each particular opcode. Is that okay? But there's one more problem. <laughs> The other problem is um, the XX field needs to be changed. Because when I use XX underscore field inside the slices, um, it is it's triggering the logic inside the subroutine byte slice to automatically go through all the possible cases of X, which is not what I want to do. So I have to change that part too. So we have to locate the item here. Okay, we are look, looking at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay. So we'll say <coughs> slices 0, 10 is xx. And then the other one, you know, which is this one, also needs to be designated the same way. So that's going to be 12. It's also going to be xx. So I have to manually change these you know, individually to generate the four uh, variables that we are dealing with. Okay, so I think that should do the trick. Okay. Of course, the you know, increment needs to have the same fix too, but I need to double check to make sure that this one works first and then we'll fix the other one. Tested by doing this. Okay. So they're off by seventy eight each one. So that would be correct because we are looking at zero 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 being the first one, zero one zero one being the second one. These are off by five, right? But because we have to pad four zeros to the right hand side, which is the same thing as multiply by 16, five times 16 is 80, but 80 minus two is 78, so that is correct. The next one up is 1010. Zero, one, zero. When you subtract one, zero, one, zero, one from 100, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, it is also zero, one, zero, one, which is five, okay? So these two are off by five as well. And then the last one is one, 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 and when you subtract 1010, zero, one, zero, which is 10, from 1111, one, 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 which is 15, they're also off by 5. So having 78 positions between all those you know, opcodes or all those you know, microcodes is in fact correct. So I can, I can look at this and you know, make sure that it is generating the correct code. So now we can just copy dec.c to in.c. Actually, uh, let's take a look at in.c first. Because the only difference between these two is the uh, operation that we're specifying. So we'll copy decrement to increment and then change increment. But I cannot remember which location is supposed to be the um, ALUOP. 
So we'll go ahead and open ucode.c2 because the, the clue is open. <coughs> ALUOP is 012345. So it's 012345. So this one needs to change to a zero right there to specify an add operation instead of a subtract operation. There we go. Make another one. Copy all that one to the parent folder and just redo, you know, reload it so we can open all that one again. And that this time we will double check again. So E50 has 15185B8, which is correct. I just debug my own code. But now we can rerun the same sample program and see whether it works or not. Yep. The location of the slices. In which one? Ooh, that's right. Okay. Good point. Because now that these two will overwrite over wipe out each other. So in dot C needs to remember to use D0 instead of E0. There we go. check the D as well, so we have D50 being different from the other ones. Okay, that's good. Okay, that looks right to me. Yep. Okay. Now we can retest the program. That's why, you know, even when I press the reset button, it doesn't, it didn't do a single thing. There we go. So we'll go ahead and load the same program. And we'll enable the takes. Do we need to walk? Huh? Are we already logging or watching the register? Yeah, we are, yeah. It, it, it's keeping the same log, so it should be good. It should be okay. So go to <coughs> end. And flex is still changed once. The register is correct. Register is going from zero to one, back to zero, and then back to negative one. So that part is correct. But the flex register is updated exactly once. Hmm. And this, yeah. I feel like the increment decrement had the same exact output uh, in ROM, the same exact information, uh, hex code. The same hex code. In the ROM. In the ROM. Okay, that's... Uh, that D, uh, D5 was equivalent to E5. Oh yeah, it looked the same. Yeah, it looked the same. Hmm. D50 and E50 look the same. Okay, let me let me check the source code first. So we want to look at in.c. This is this is also a really good uh, cool tool that you can use is to use a dash o so you can display the files side by side. So that makes it easier to compare. Um, they're not supposed to be the same because this is supposed this is a zero for adding and this is a one for subtracting. So they're not they should not be the same. But I think they were in the wrong. They were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. In the wrong. Okay. So when you look at the, well, we might as well check the rest of the program too. So when you look at the rest of the program, this part should be the same, except the opcode would be different. So one is a D0 as a base, and the other one is E0 as a base. So that part is correct. And the structure of the program should still be the same. All right, so we'll look into the ROM and see if those two locations are the same. So you're looking at D50, and then we're looking at E50. Oh no, they're a little different. Yeah, they're different. This zero oh, is a one yeah. over here, yeah. which is appropriate because that is controlling the um, I think the ALUOP, the operation to the ALU. Yep. Couldn't it be, um, it seemed like the flag 
should really change the, the flags register. And when we look at the assemble tab, these are all correct. Okay, one zero, one zero for C is correct. So to debug this one, the flags register was initialized to zero, and then it got into a zero, and then it, it, it's cleared. when we increment it. But yeah. when we drop it back to zero, it doesn't set the flag anymore. Hmm. I think you have to reset the log. It might be from the previous one. You're right. That might be the case because it's, it's from, the, from the run before. So we'll go ahead and probably reset. I think you have to like, Hmm? I shifted back, back to 11 and we selected it. Oh, there's no way to clear the table yeah, itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you use a file, I think you can uh, select whether to overwrite or not. Okay. So you have to, you have to remove it and then re add it. Ah, uh, yeah. okay. So it's a tool issue. Assembly code on the other side. 
decides to open the, the, the editor in a different workspace. There you go. OK. So we'll, do, uh, we'll deal with main first, OK? Because main is the start location. Um, do you guys want to use a, an actual variable with x? Let's, do, let's use a variable for x. So we'll go ahead and use you know, x as a variable. The, the way to do that is to specify you know, this is a byte. Okay? And you can specify how you want to initialize the byte. So in this case, we can just go ahead and initialize it with a value of 4. So when you say x colon byte 4, x is the label, which is a symbolic name of the location. Byte is not an R code per se, but it does allocate the one um, byte, and th that location is going to be initialized to a value of four. Is that okay? So it's the same thing as allocating or declaring a global variable with a constant of four stored into, in it. Um, main is here. It is the first location. We are not going to use the label main. It's just here for documentation purposes. Um, x equals 4 is already done because x is initialized to 4 to begin with. So now we, it's time to call the subroutine. How do we call a subroutine? What, is the, what are the two things we have to do in order to call a subroutine? We have to first we remember where to get back to. Okay, So that's, you know, that's a stack operation. And then we continue execution or do a branch into the subroutine that we want to call. So those are the two steps. Do we have a stack? We don't have a stack. We haven't allocated and we haven't initialized a stack pointer. So the first thing is to designate you know, a particular stack pointer. Um, I think we were using D as a stack pointer before, so we can use that convention. So we will use you know, D as the stack pointer. How do we initialize the stack pointer? So that you know, D is one byte past the last location in RAM. Do you guys remember zero we did that? Hmm? No, nope. it's zero itself. Okay, because what what is the stack pointer pointing to? What is the definition of the stack pointer? What is uh, the last item pushed? So when your stack is empty, which means there's actually nothing there, it should point one byte past the end of your memory that is that you're allocating for a stack. So that's why you know, the way we initialize the stack order is to initialize D with a zero. But we now know, that, you know a trick to initialize D with a zero. This particular opcode will take up two bytes because this zero is taking up a byte on its own. If your objective is really just to clear the register D with a value so that it becomes a zero, and you don't really mind changing the flags register, one way to do this is to do a subtraction dd. Okay, that's the reason why we kept the subtraction opcode and instead we hijacked the compare opcode instead in the exam question. Okay. So this will help initialize stack order. Okay, once we have a stack order, we can now you know, go ahead and implement the call. And the first thing we need to do is to remember where to come back to. So we'll use a label to remember where we're supposed to come back to. So now we need to store L1 onto the stack. How do we do that? We first need to put L1 into a register first, because we cannot store a literal constant directly into a space in memory. So we need to do LDI and kind of use the register A as a scratch register to and put L1 into it. Then we can put it onto the stack. But before we put it onto the stack, we have to um, allocate the stack. How do we allocate a byte on the stack? What do we do with the stack corner and say, hey, you know, go ahead and allocate one more byte so that we can use that to store something. In which direction does the, does, the, does the stack grow? Does it grow to higher memory location, or does it grow to lower memory location? Lower, because it's initialized to the highest possible location. So when we allocate, we are decrementing the stack corner. 
Okay. So this is where the stack pointer, well, this is where the deck in decrement instruction comes in handy because now we can say decrement register D. So that whatever register D is pointing to is now you know the space available so we can store something in it. Then we can go ahead and store into whatever D is pointing to, whatever A has. The ST instruction is the only instruction at this point that can store something into RAM. So this is the only way you can store the return address on the stack at this point. Is that okay? Then we can go ahead and jump to the subroutine. And we have the JMPI instruction already. Might as well make use of that. So we can jump into the location F, which is the label designating the beginning or the entry point of the subroutine. When we come back, there's really nothing to do because you know in a regular C program we have return zero. But when we're doing this in assembly, especially using the toy processor, the only thing we can really do is to say, well, you know, don't do anything after this. Get stuck. So now we can go ahead and look at F and go like, hmm, what do we do with F? The first thing we need to do is to compare X to zero. But X is actually corresponding to a location in memory, we cannot compare directly with that. So the first thing we need to do is to load um, the address X or the label X into one of the registers. I'm going to pick the register A again as a um, scratch register. So this will put label X into register A so that I can dereference A in order to get to the content at that location. Now, depending on how much you want to optimize the code, you can you know, just kind of keep um, register A with the label X, and then use another register to contain the value that you're storing, so that this way, when we actually do the decrement, we don't have to reload it again. So this is just a little bit of optimization uh, that you can possibly do when you're doing this. So we'll go ahead and use another register to store the content at that memory location so that we can compare to zero with that. So we'll go ahead and do an LD because this is reading from memory. So we are reading into register B. Whatever A is pointing to is going to be stored in register B. So this will give us the value that we need to compare to zero. But compare cannot compare with a constant. It has to compare with another register. So now we have to do a sub CC. So the C is now a zero. So now we have used up all the registers. Now we can do a compare. We compare X with zero. The value of X is stored in register B already. Register C is just a zero. So we can do this compare like this. Now there are two ways to do this. Because we can do it this way. With this particular program, because X is an int, Technically speaking, we have to do a signed comparison, which is not as easy. But because of the way we initialize x, it will decrement to 3, 2, 1, and then a 0. We will we'll never go negative. So if you want to kind of shortcut this, you can just use the z flag after the compare to decide whether you need to branch or not. So we will do a shortcut here, and then we'll do a jci to end if. And then end if is just a label marking the end of the conditional statement. In other words, we are saying if x is not greater than 0, and the only thing that we are checking, which is kind of iffy, is you know, that we if whether x is 0 or not. We can confirm that x is 0. If you want to check the other one, you, know, you can also do a JLI. If x is less than um, 0, then we also want to end up at end if. Okay. So this will catch both cases. If x is 0, we branch. If x is less than 0, we also branch. Okay. So whatever we specify here is to specify decrement x and uh, a recursive call to f. So in order to decrement x, you might think that we can just do a deck b like that. That is not going to work. If you, if you just do a deck B and then you do the recursive call, then B is never stored back into the memory location. 
which means the next invocation for comparison for comparison purposes is not going to work correctly because we never updated the RAM location. So you, you have to do a deck B because we have to decrement the value of register X, but we have to remember to store that back into the location first. So since we haven't really changed register A, and register A is still having the label X, which is the location of that particular variable, we can now store B back into X first. We are, we are updating the value of X, the global variable. Then we can go ahead and do the recursive call to, the, uh, to itself. So the recursive call is going to look the same as what we have here. First thing we need to do is to uh, allocate the space, which means we have to decrement the stack pointer, which is D. Okay, so this is decrementing the stack pointer, uh, allocate space on the stack. Then we can go ahead and specify where, what do we want to store there. We can use register A for that purpose. So we can store um, another label 2, and label 2 is going to be here, the return address basically. We put it into A, and then we use an ST, this time we use D uh, to, as a pointer to point to where we are storing. And then A is the scratch register containing the label itself, which is the point to continue execution after the subroutine is return, has returned. So this will complete the call operation, short of this one single instruction, which is a jump instruction to function F itself. So are there any questions about these four instructions together? Because these four instructions together, along with the label definition of L2, is call. This is how we call a subroutine. Yep. Uh, why are we storing L2 in A? I thought we were keeping A. We weren't touching A, but I thought we were storing what X was every iteration. We want this override it. Why are we storing into A? I thought we were supposed to keep A as X, nope. and that's why we kept, uh, we stored the B back into A to update our X. Well, okay, there are two reasons. One, when we come back from calling F, there's nothing else to do. Right? So it doesn't make any sense that we want to preserve the value of register A. And then the second one is we only have four registers. So as a subroutine, when you're calling another subroutine, you can't really assume your registers will remain unchanged because everybody wants to use the same four registers. Is that okay? So within a subroutine, you can kind of optimize and say, okay, I'm, use, I'm keeping A for this purpose, I'm keeping B for this purpose. But the moment you call a subroutine, you kind of, you, you have to say, oh, okay, that other subroutine may use the same registers. I better not make the assumption that the registers will remain unchanged when, when, when I call a subroutine. Okay, all right, cool. So these five lines, together is basically calling the subroutine f, and then we get to end if after that. So technically speaking, we do not need to define a new label L2, because L2 and end if will end up having exactly the same value, because there's no instruction defined between these two labels. So they're technically the same, but the <coughs> semantics are different. One is indicating the return address, the other one is indicating where's the end of the conditional statement. So for that purpose, I will still keep these two as separate labels. At the end if, we don't have anything else to do. It's time to return from the subroutine. So if we know that this is how we call a subroutine, can you kind of imagine what we need to do to return from a subroutine? We have to reverse all of these operations in the opposite order which means instead of storing something onto the stack, we are retrieving something from the stack. Instead of allocating a byte on the stack, we are deallocating a byte on the stack, okay? And then we have a jump instruction to utilize whatever we retrieve from the stack, which is the return address. Is that part, of, is that part okay? Okay, concept bytes. So now we can go ahead and specify the return instructions. So we're gonna reverse the loss operation first. This is the operation that we want to reverse, okay? So the reverse of this is an LD instruction. So instead of updating RAM, we are reading from RAM into register A, and we're still using register D because that's our stack pointer. Then the next thing we want to do 
is to increment D instead of decrement D because decrementing D is allocating you know, an additional byte on the stack. Now that this location is utilized, we can get rid of deallocate this particular byte. So the corresponding operation is to increment the stack order. Okay. Increment the stack order, deallocate space. And now that the stack is critical balanced, it is time to um, do the actual return or continue execution based on whatever we retrieve from the stack. So this is where the JMP, the original JMP instruction is going to be handy because JMP A is going to use register A to tell the processor where to continue execution. In other words, JMP A is going to update the program counter based on register A. So I think this should be it. It's our first recursive subroutine. Doesn't do anything particularly useful but it's supposed to be, do the recursion and it's supposed to back up as well. You guys want to give it a try? Okay, we got, we still have about five, you know, six minutes. I think we should do it, we should be able to do it. So we have control A, control C, copy and, select and copy. Go to the assembler, go to my source tab. Paste the whole thing. The indentation is gone. You know, uh, the Google spreadsheet does not handle leading spaces, but the comments are still here. The comments is not a problem. Um, the assembler actually can ignore all the comments. So we want to scroll through this just to make sure there's no syntax error or no, uh, no uh, assembled time error because that, that will show up over here. Now that this is all seem to be okay, we can go to the RAM file. This is the actual, these are the opcodes corresponding to this program. This four that is kind of like, you know, all the way out on its own is the four that is our global variable x, okay? So we'll go ahead and uh, download this as a CSV file. And we'll call this recursion CSV. Switch back to the simulator. Make sure that we have simulate mode on. Click the reset button. Load the new program in. This is called recursion.csv. So we, now we got the program in. When we go to the logging, we want to log it differently this time. Okay, so can someone tell me what I should be logging in this particular case? What is important so that I can tell whether this program is working correctly or not? Register. Register D is very important because that's our stack pointer. We should see go from 00, zero to FF and then to FE because we have five levels of calls. So that means we're gonna use up five locations on the stack. So we should see the stack pointer going from 00, zero which is the initialization value, to FF, FE, FD, um, FC, and then FB. Okay? And then it should go back up again. So register D, in fact, is one of the important registers. So we'll go to our register bank and pick out that one. We'll log it. Okay? What else do you think is important? What is controlling whether we should do recursion or not? That RAM location, you know, X is important, okay? So we want to find out what is the location of X. You can either use the assembler to find out, because when you look at the assembler, it will show the source code on column A, but then it will also show you the actual location in another column. So we're looking at column 34. And the location is at 28 in hexadecimal. So we want to look at uh, location 28 in RAM. We should see that location going from 4 to 3 to 2 to 1 to 0, and then remain as 0 for the rest of the execution of this program. Go back to the simulator, specify that we want that location. Is it 28? I think it's 28. So go to RAM. You can specify any location. It just doesn't give you a very handy way of just saying, oh, these are all in decimal, by the way. How do I know this is decimal? 
Well, because zero is following nine. But two eight is hexadecimal. So what is two eight as a decimal number? Two times sixteen plus eight. So that's thirty-two plus eight, which is forty. Okay. So it should correspond to location forty in decimal. So with these two, so this location in red is particularly <coughs> important to us. What else should we log? Well, these two are the most important ones. If the program doesn't work, doesn't behave, then we probably have to log something else to debug the program, okay? If the program works correctly, we should be able to confirm that it does work correctly by looking at the changes to register D as well as the RAM location that is supposed to be the global variable X. Before we run this program, I just want to check one more thing, just to make sure that the location containing the four is at the right place. Just to make sure I'm not reading it incorrectly. Okay, this is one. Ooh, that that two that twenty eight is actually twenty eight. It's in decimal. <laughs> Good thing I checked. Okay, so we need to go back to the login and say, nope, this is the wrong place. It is actually 28, it's just 28, it's not in hexadecimal. There we go. So now this is the right location. All right, well, we can go ahead and just run it at full speed. Um, we'll just check one more thing. We'll just go ahead and log one more, one more item. The program counter is also useful. Because the program counter, it kind of leaves a trail of you know where we have been in this program, so it is also very useful. So we'll log the program counter too. There we go. And we'll just go ahead and let the program go. You can see how it's accessing the stack. And doing the recursion because you can see it's starting from the beginning of M at the end. There because I think the uh, the variable is now one. That was zero. This is the last level of recursion. After this, it should do all the returns. Yep. And this should be the last return. Then it should go back to main and then get stuck in with a halt instruction. So it looks like it's correct. Let's turn off uh, the ticking, go to the logging, go to this table. This time it's going to be a little bit long because it'll be logged from the program counter. So it's going to be a little bit long. But the key is, do we see uh, the counter going from four to three to one and then down to zero? Okay, that's location 28, which is this column here. Um, one zero zero in binary is four in decimal. And we can see how it changed from four to three, from three to two, and then from two to one, and then from one to zero, and then it remained at zero you know, forever for the rest of the execution of this code. So that's good. The second thing we also want to check is to make sure that the stack pointer is going down first and then going back up again, okay? So it was originally initialized to zero because that's one byte past the end of random space. Then it got decremented to FF, FE, FD, FC, uh, FB, and then it got it, then it go back it goes back up again. And how far do you think it should go back up to? In other words, by the time I get to the halt instruction, what do you think the stack pointer should be? Should be back to zero. Okay. So we want to scroll through this and see whether it went back to zero or not, and it did. Okay, so these two are pretty good indication that the program does work correctly, you know, that I did not make a mistake you know, somewhere. But if you want to track down the program counter, it's a little bit more cumbersome, because these are all in binary, and then when you look at the spreadsheet, it's all expressed in um, decimal. 
So these are all decimal numbers. So it, it will take you a little bit of conversion, you know, just to track down, okay, you know, what is this instruction? How is it corresponding to the source file? So it will take you a little bit of time to track it down like that. I can, I can, I, my, my cock is already turning <laughs> to, to make use of a log file so I can actually go back to the, to this file and then it can kind of tell you, you know, which location it's going back to. So maybe I will do that tool over the weekend. <clears throat> So, but are there any questions about calling and returning? But is this helping you to understand recursion a little bit more? Okay. But this is not explaining you know, how we use parameters and also local variables. It's only telling you how we pass control to a subroutine after we you know, tell the subroutine, oh, when you're done, go back to this location. This is the location to go back to and then store that on the stack. Are the, is this okay so far, or are there any questions that I can answer regarding calling and returning itself? So, so mm -hmm. step just keep the location where you have to return once you're done with the subroutine? Yes, the return address is stored on the stack. And that's done by, when we, when we do the calls, that's, that's what we do basically. The first part of a call is to store the return address. Okay, so when you look at this code here, um, these, these five lines is corresponding to call. L1 doesn't really do anything particularly useful except to indicate where, what is the return address. When the subroutine is done, where is it supposed to go continue execution? That's the purpose of L1. But L1 has to be stored on the stack because the stack is the space where you store the return address. So we have to load L1 into register A and then we allocate a byte on the stack so that we can store that location onto the stack. And then we do a jump to F because now it is time to continue execution in the subroutine. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. why, why did we decrement D? Because the stack pointer points to the last byte that you use. Okay? So before we can store something onto the stack, we have to allocate it first. So that the stack pointer consistently is pointing to the last byte that you push. Is that okay? Alright. Okay, so I don't have any homework for you guys just yet, okay? But this is going to be the basis of the next homework assignment. We only got two weeks left. <laughs> Any questions? No? Okay. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. How did you know the global variable again? The global variable is static. Right. It is a byte at the very end. Um, if you just say byte 4, all it's going to do is to allocate a byte and initialize that byte to 4 in RAM. But how do we get to it, right? And that's why we need a label x colon right before this line so that we can refer to the symbolic name corresponding to the address known as x. This is also kind of how global variables are allocated. It's really just you know somewhere in RAM. It doesn't change the location, doesn't change, and there's only one copy, which is the main difference between a global variable as opposed to a local variable. Because a local variable, as we will see next week, is allocated for each invocation, and then it's deallocated after each invocation as well. But the global variable is just sitting there statically at that location 28. Right, the assembler is doing all the counting for you. So it, it just counts you know, all the bytes you know, before you know, x colon and say that, oh, this is location 28. So this way I don't have to keep the count and remember, instead of using uh, the symbolic name x, you know, I would rather not have to use 28 everywhere. Yeah. All right, so if there are no questions, I'm going to stop the lecture. 
and I will still go to the lab in case anyone wants to either revisit what we talked about today or to talk about the exam. Um, 